go. There we go. Is that oh, right? Yes, it's not, the, it's not locked by This is so nice. Okay, let's do this. This is the people we know, man. <coughs> <coughs> oh, man, people are going to have to be patient with me because I got a cough. Get you should go straight into it, my brother. Right now? Don't be yeah, yeah. This area is a danger area. Okay, yeah. give me one <laughs> second. <laughs> no mind here yeah. yeah. to save our voices. Yes, please, come closer, come closer, come closer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. This is our super session which we've managed to have Alhamdulillah, during Ramadan. And we've got uh, a very insightful night, inshallah, ahead for you guys. Um, I'll just quickly go through what we have in store. So um, we, I'm joined with uh, Mufti Moinu Abu Hamza, who needs no introductions, but co-founder of the Quran Institute and resident Mufti of the Quran Institute as well. Resident? Because you're here all the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of what the program event is for today. Um, Mufti Moina will be speaking until about 7.30 p.m. and then we'll be joined by our guest uh, who will speak from 7.30 until 8 o'clock inshallah. Um, Mufti Moina's talk will be on Seeking Excellence Ihsan with a Renewed Vision for the Ummah. Just a few housekeeping rules. Um, firstly with the crash. so please make sure uh, that your children are remain in the crash whilst the Maghrib is still happening. After that, bring them out and obviously we'll be having iftar, inshallah. Um, in terms of fire safety, I've been told to announce this. So we do have a fire safety point which is round the corner. If you leave, you take a right and you take another right over at the church over there on the right side, inshallah. Um, so without further ado, I think that's all the announcements. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mufti Moinul to begin the first part of today's event, inshallah. And you got a second one as well. Oh, there's two. There's two. All right. I'm lower it now. Thank God I'm wearing a t-shirt. Okay. All right. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillahi r-Rahmani r-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlu al-uqtat min lisani yafqahu qawli. Alhamdulillah Rabbi al-Alamin. Wa salat wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali baytih al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma alamtana inna ka anta al-Alim al-Hakim. Allahumma alimna bima yamfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma. وارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباع وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وادخلنا برحمتك في عبادك الصالحين عما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters in Islam جزاكم الله خير for uh, making the effort to come down we're about to spend a bit of time reflecting on the Quran and the word reflect is probably the most important word for me in the month of Ramadan that if I were to say what would be the number one goal of every single Muslim in the month of Ramadan the goal would be to reflect Wallahi Azim. because we don't seem to have as much reflection some of us I don't want to expose anyone's age right but some of us who remember Ramadan from 10 years ago 15 years ago 20 years ago, some people are nodding. Well, I can go further, 30 years ago, right? However old we are, right? I'm bit old. We just remember the different Ramadan. And there are improvements, but there also have been major, major things that have gone missing. There's some of the essence. Can't you feel it? Or is it just me? Is it just me? Maybe I'm too judgmental. I don't know. But in Ramadan, I feel that certain things that my father taught me, when he took me to the masjid and I did 20 rak'ah now they would call uh, child protection services for if my dad took me to do I was like 8 you go on the 253 I think it's the 254 now everything changes and I went on the bus and he would take me to East London Masjid and 20 rak'ah 
Get up, son. Get up. One more. Just you can do one more. Get up, son. One more. You know? And there was a real spirit of empowerment and struggle and fight in us, to be honest. And I'm not saying that that's gone. But I'm saying that that's sometimes misdirected, sometimes lacking reflection. And that's why I want you to really consider and think about that the month of Ramadan is a different experience in every stage in the history of the, the life of Muslims. It's different. There is no Ramadan that should be the same. There's no Ramadan for you personally that should be the same. If you are living some sort of Ramadan Groundhog Day, I worry. We should be having, thinking about the context of the Muslims in this country, <coughs> the context of the wider Ummah, the context of how the community has moved in directions that have fallen to the wayside and in other ways that haven't. And we're going to reflect together and we're going to use and I'm going to thread through the, this talk, hopefully a tapestry of ayat of the Qur'an that explain perhaps our condition because that's what you should be doing. What you should be doing and what I should be doing is reading this Qur'an with fresh eyes, open heart and say, what's this Qur'an saying about us under the weight of civilization, under the condition that our ummah finds itself, our community and its challenges? You think we're in the same Ramadan? Do you honestly think we're in the same Ramadan? I think part of the khutbah of uh, the Imam, uh, who's as, uh, as much of the masjid, he's as old, not as old as the masjid, that's not very, right? but you know, it's known to be one of the most senior figures in our local masjid. He's on Twitter trending. You got an old sheikh, imam, generally a quiet disposition, and now he's tweet, t trending on Twitter for a statement and, and people trying to cancel him and take out of context what he said. And people are not considering that religious leadership is also not perfect and it never was and it never will be. And therefore there is a, a kind of a uh, we don't let people off, but we have a certain understanding that we're in it together. We're not a class war battle between the knowledgeable and the laity against the musalli and the, you know, and the imam. This is not a class war battle. But you can see that framework of looking at things didn't agree, exist as a framework 20 years ago when I was a kid. I definitely can tell you that that wasn't the case. So every Ramadan is different, my brothers and sisters. That's why I want you to evaluate. And therefore, this Qur'an, the tafsir must be revisited. And we look at the, obviously, there are core meanings of the Qur'an. For that, you go to the classical tafsir, which I will be. But we need to see through the lens of the classical jurists and see the world here. Not look through the lens of the classical jurists and mufassirun and exegetes and look into 7th century. We need to look into the 21st century. And I feel that that, whatever scale of reflection I've just uh, given you right now, is severely lacking as a conversation in our community. I think it's severely lacking, if I, was, if I were to say. So we've called it, with great hopes, this event, we've called it a night of Ihsan, right? A night of excellence. What is Ihsan? Jibreel alayhi salam, he sat with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He put his palms on his thigh. Yeah? And he asked him certain questions. He asked him, what is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? And one of the things we learn from this hadith, which I won't go into a commentary about the hadith, is that Ihsan, excellence, wanting to be the best, is informed by Iman and Islam. What do I mean by that? Ihsan is informed by Iman meaning, without going into nitty gritty, our purpose in life and being sincere. You have no Iman if you don't believe your purpose of life is tied to Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you're not sincere, it doesn't really matter if you say you believe. It doesn't matter anyway. So it's your Ihsan, your seeking of excellence must be tied and anchored by Al-Iman. That's the first thing. I don't think that our seeking of excellence in the month of Ramadan is always tied to Iman. And I, will, I usually kind of make a case for these things and then I, 
I hopefully get, you know, justify it. And then I don't think necessarily that ihsan, seeking excellence, is being rooted into al-Islam. What is al-Islam? Full submission to all of the laws in its full comprehensivity. This is not happening, brothers and sisters. We have a, a sliver, a, a, a small like uh, flicker of what Islam is meant to be. And what we've done is, is that we've stretched and focused on a few things about Ramadan. And it is basically ritual, that the, rit the ritual. And be careful, brothers and sisters, because focusing on ritual doesn't actually make you pious. Focusing on ritual in the way Allah has commanded is what makes you pious, makes you have taqwa. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala alladheena min qabilikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. La'allakum muttaqoon. It's basically in the hope you fast, in the hope that you become muttaqoon. I think much of the essence of Ramadan as a result where we're thinking muttaqoon, being a muttaqi is someone who's going through the motions of Ramadan. Ramadan, even for the brothers, I can't comment, I don't, know, I don't know your lives, everyone's here, but you know, some of the brothers I spend time with and some of the brothers I speak to, Ramadan, 20 raka'at, has become some kind of gladiator episode, some kind of American ninja, you know, where we have to go through an obstacle course and have that burger, you know, and you know, have that overpriced mojito, yeah? It's crazy. This is, is this what Ramadan is? Ramadan is not the process, it's not the process. And I'll show you how sometimes we, miss, we mistake the process for the actual aim of Ramadan. So Ihsan, for us to really have excellence, nobody wants to have a drab, uh, boring Ramadan. Nobody <coughs> says, oh, I'll, do, I'll, I'll be uh, uh, less than average, I'll be adequate. Everybody goes for excellence in the month of Ramadan. And if we're going for excellence, then we have to <coughs> genuinely reflect on what have I accessed in this religion? How have I accessed the Quran to start a new Islam in my life? To really have a fresh perspective after Eid? You know, how, what have I, what, because so many Ramadans have gone by for many of us. We're, and we're, this, we're very much the same in many ways. And we have so many apps and things being offered to us, so many courses and so on. And yet the situation stays the same and sometimes even worsens. You know, Hassan al-Basri, he said a very nice, uh, people rarely mention this quote, but it's such a beautiful quote. He said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَعَلَ الصَّوْمَ مِضْمَارًا لِعِبَادِهِ لِيَسْتَبِقُوا إِلَى طَاعَتِهِ Such a beautiful statement. Hassan al-Basri, he's uh, uh, the generation after the Sahaba. Tabi'un. He said, Indeed Allah Jala Soma Midmaran. Indeed Allah made the fast a arena, a stadium. You know, like in the Olympics, if you write Midmar on the on Google search right now, Midmar with Biddad, you will see that it shows racing tracks, marathons being run, javelins. Yeah? You'll never go to an arena. If, unless I'm mistaken, I haven't watched, but you know, if you go to a Olympics and there was only someone throwing a javelin and saying, let's go home. Yeah, you think, what's this is the Olympics, man. We're supposed to have at least 20 different events. But that's how Ramadan has become. Ramadan is an arena, is a coliseum. It's a place where much struggle is done. And it has a, vari it has a variety of things that we're supposed to do. And now the variety is gone. The variety is there in your pakora. The variety is there in, um, I mean, so many things, but they're all yellow, right? And you have all these things. But where is the variety in the ibadah? Where is the variety in the ibadah? Where is the variety? Like as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just said, pray 20 raka'at, have mangoes and cream at uh, suhoor. Yeah, uh, you know, what's going on? We have lost, we have lost that. If you see a person who loves the dunya, you will find. And we all have some uh, link to the dunya. You will find we are connoisseurs. We talk about coffee, skinny flat white, and this and that, and different types of beans, right? Everyone is a connoisseur 
of clothing. People know many types of thobe. You know, people go to the barbers and they ask me, what do you want? I say, a haircut. I don't know. But people have names for a million different types of things now. But when we come to ibadah, jaff, dry, no variety, not thinking about what are the multiple ways I can please Allah in a month where the rewards are multiplied. So this is something that is missing. He says, Inna Allah ja'ala sawma midmaran li ibadihi li yastabiqu ila ta'atihi that, so that they can compete and race towards ta'atihi to the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this race is not just taraweeh, though taraweeh is important. You know taraweeh is actually the rest you take from what you're doing in Ramadan. It's, that's what taraweeh is. Taraweeh yeah, tarweeh, it comes from, it's the plural of tarweeh, rawwaha, yurawwihu, tarweeh. Therefore, tarawih is to have multiple rests. Istirah, it's to take rest between every four raka'ah. It's about rest. It wasn't the, it wasn't the end goal. Ya, bil, ya Bilal, aqim salah arihna biha. Ya Bilal, establish the salah and give us comfort through it. Not arihna minha. What's arihna minha? Anyone know a bit of about, you know, huruful jar? Yeah? Arihna minha means, let me go and do the worship and go, oh, thank God that's over. Oh my God, what a relief. Where are the mojitos? Right? But instead, what we are supposed to do is find the tranquility, arihna minha, yani minas salah. We're supposed to take the tranquility through the salah. But if you live as a community, disturbed, dysfunctional, and intranquil, then how will we find tranquility in the Salah? It's a bit strange, putting so much burden on poor Salah. Poor Salah. The Salah has so much meaning and value, and we've put the world's problems that the Salah must fix, and Zakat and charity must fix. There are so many other obligations in the Deen that are in this Olympic, in this Colosseum of Ibadah, that we are not seeking and that we are not even aware of. And that's why I said this month is a time to reflect. So this is Ihsan basically. Ihsan is doing things in a way where you are certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. Yeah? And like you can see him, but you cannot. And you know that he sees you. Now, taqwa. Yeah, just these are very like, this is, I'm not talking about in Ramadan, I'm talking about the fruits of Ramadan. How do you gain the fruits of taqwa in the month, uh, outside of this month of Ramadan, taking it through? I know it's a bit strange, we're doing fruits and then roots after, but you know, we'll, we'll manage. So look at the fruits of Ramadan, the fruits of taqwa. Taqwa is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as the end goal, the end goal of, of this Ramadan. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, what does that mean anyone? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu All these huffaz, many of you Brother What does ya ayyuhalladheena amanu mean? Oh you who believe Yeah, as we find in many translations But this is a translation If you just look at the word First of all you know that uh, You know, amana Yeah, to be amin Or aman Is you, oh you who believe It means it has two connotations to that word That is missed in your English translation Hint, hint, what language I think you should be studying after Ramadan. That, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, amanu means, O oh, you who have committed to Allah, commitment. Believe is a weak word in English. I believe, I've said this to some, brother, some of my students so they know this, so apologies for the repetition. But it's so important to know, because it's the core, they are like, something like 50, 60 times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, and you read all of them in a way that is weak. Oh, you have, if I say, I believe I love my wife, what does that mean? Better still, with all the gym promises we make during Ramadan, yeah? I believe in going to the gym. Who would accept that in this? Forget Allah Azza wa Jal, Amana Billah, Alladheena Yu'minuna Bil Ghaib, people who believe in Allah's book and all of these things. No, no, no. Just gym. If someone said, I believe I should go to the gym, platinum membership. And then when you see him, gym day is Thursday, on Thursday you see him sitting with you and go, and he goes, I believe, you're not going to find a problem with that really. You're going to say, ah, what happened man? And you'll joke with him, and you'll tease him a little bit, but it won't be a big deal. But when a man says, I have committed 
I have committed to the gym. Then now it's a problem. They say, well, you would be for you. I thought you had a commitment. So, Ya ayu alladina amanu, oh, you who have committed. This is in Medina, where the Muslims now, the Islam is becoming part of the social and personal fabric. It's becoming interlocked, where the internal Islam and the external Islam are both merging. That it's becoming part of the social fabric and it's being part of the fabric of our own nafs and our own personalities, our own shakhsiya. They're both meeting. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. It also means those who are secure in their belief in Allah. As opposed to being insecure. Because the mufassirun say that the munafiqs were hearing this verse. And some of them were pretending to be Muslim. Things were very good at that time. That even the mona- they, they would turn up to the mosque. They would pray fajr. <laughs> they would be doing ibadah. Because they wanted to fit in. Because they were insecure. What about us? When we are now in a majority non-Muslim host nation. We are citizens in this country. How do we view when we talk about, you know, not even water. Fasting, why are you fasting for? How do we explain it to our non-Muslim, compa- uh, you know, uh, colleagues and friends and neighbors? We have to think about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as-siyam, ya yu aladheena amanu, O you who are secure in your faith in Allah and you have committed to Allah, it has been prescribed. It has been commanded. And as soon as we have that culture where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, it's time for us to commit. When Allah commands, we commit. That's how it works. It's an executive order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to commit. Ya ayu ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as Fasting has been prescribed for you. Kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. This is also so important for understanding taqwa. All the meanings of these will explain to you what this taqwa is. Because the Christians and the Jews, in the tafsir al-Tabari, it was also mentioned that they used to also fast. Some even for the equivalent time of 30 days. But they sometimes would change the number of days. And the Christians specifically, they moved the fast to the spring. You know, in the summer, you know, it's, it was a bit difficult. So they shifted the, their fasting, their month of fasting to the spring. They changed their religion. That's why Allah is addressing us. A failed past paper, a failed nation who have failed the exam as an ummah. And oh you who believe the new successful hope, the new hope for mankind, the new nation. That you have been prescribed fasting. Despite the failures that you are surrounded by, you're going to succeed in this. Yeah? And then it says, Kutiba alaykum sallam, kama kutiba ala ladina min qabilikum la'allakum tattaqoon. And then it's to do with taqwa. Taqwa is very simple. Sometimes I feel we have so many talks, we don't even explain what taqwa is. Taqwa is for you to, um, for you to gravitate towards all of the awamir, commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is for you to have an aversion to all of the nahi, yeah? the nawahi, the f- prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is for you to have in your heart and in your physicality a movement, a harakah towards action. And it is for you to have, uh, to move away from anything that is muharram, that is made haram. And ultimately all that that is for, for the one who wants taqwa, is so that he escapes and is free from the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he may attain the rida and the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what taqwa is. That's what classically it is known. Most people, we can go through the whole of Ramadan and someone says, what's taqwa? He says, being scared of God, something like this. Yeah? This is not a month to be scared of God. This is a month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not abandon mankind. This is the month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to man. What do you think Laylatul Qadr is? It is the night when the Creator spoke to the creation. That's an amazing thing. It's unfathomable. It's hard to even imagine. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created everything reached out. And in a language that is a human, Arabic is a human language. There's nothing divine about Arabic language. He reached out to human beings in their language, sent them a Nabi to save us from the disasters and the perils of this life. The trappings and the, if we're left to our own, divi- we're supposed to believe as Muslims that hudal guidance to mankind means that without guidance, 
we are utterly lost. Ma'ishatan danka. How many of us would say that without the Quran we feel ultimately lost? Because that's exactly what the inverse of that is. That is what it is to have no Quran in our life, is to have no hidayah. So this is to do with the Christians. Yeah? Now, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, many of you in your workplace will probably explain how you abstain from certain things during fasting. Okay? But do you know that fasting is prescribed for Muslims? But ultimately, fasting is prescribed for everyone. You know, when you answer in your workplace as a Muslim, according to Islam, I mean, you can do that if you're being technical, but make sure you don't really, you're not saying it for you. When I say according to Islam, I'm saying it to help you. I'm not saying it because I have two minds, one where I'm not speaking according to Islam, and the other is when I'm speaking according to Islam. The non-believers, they're obliged to fast. When they say, why are you fasting? Because Allah <laughs> commanded mankind to worship Him, and one of those worships is fasting. You know, you can't pray without wudu. Everybody in this room knows this. This is a shart that leads to salah. Al-Iman is the first act of taqwa. In a, in a funny way, if you look at it as a categorical thing, that the first act of taqwa, you think taqwa comes after Iman. Technically, taqwa is, an act, uh, is the first act. Because the first act of taqwa, what's the first amr? What's the first command? Ya ayyuhal nasu abudu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum wal ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budullah. This is a verse where Allah in Medina, in, a, this in the Medinan period, it's a Madani verse, according to many of the Mufassirun, the majority in fact, that Allah is commanding the whole of Ya ayyuhal nas, all of you, you must worship Allah. And many of the exegetes discussed this and they said, the reason why He commanded mankind to worship Allah is because they need to believe in Him first so that they can worship Allah. They owe it. They, we all owe Allah has a right to be worshipped by all entirety of the creation. All human beings must bow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the fact that they don't do it is that it's la ikraha fi deen. We don't compel anyone to believe in something that he has not gone through the journey to understand. But make sure that in your sympathy for why someone doesn't understand, you're not negligent for as to why you understand. Yeah? Identity is, uh, is a big muddle in our society. So you need to remember that though you're saying according to Islam and so on, that you understand that every human being must actually fast. The first shart for that is first to believe. That's all. You can't do it without believing. You can't get ajr for fasting. So you must have iman so you can fast. But this, uh, Allah has commanded the entirety of mankind to worship Him. Ya ayyuhal nas, a'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum. That He has created you. And therefore He has every right. So Iman is actually the first act of Taqwa. Right? And this should give you a sense and feel of this ayah of its universality. That I'm trying to just give you what I think you may not have heard this month. That Ya you alladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon is a very universal statement if you study in the context of the rest of the verses. So that I know we shouldn't like mock and we should be actually compassionate and sympathetic and supportive of people who people uh, describe as Ramadan Muslims. We should be supportive and compassionate for people who have started to change themselves in the month of Ramadan. But doesn't mean we need to become Ramadan agnostics. And this is something I warn because it's, wor it's worthwhile warning us. There are Jews who are atheists who practice Hanukkah. There are Christians who are atheists. There are atheists who practice Christmas. And this month of Ramadan, from what I have observed, and I have a very small purview of what goes on in our lives, I don't, I don't know everybody's, but what I've seen a lot of is that Ramadan has become a celebration. Ramadan, I know we, get the, we celebrate receiving the month. You know, we put lights up and we put, you know, happy Ramadan or something, confetti up, whatever it is you do, yeah? But it's not a celebration. It's a coliseum. It's an arena for change. Because this is the one time that you can put a pause on, world, on the world. You can put pause on so many things in life because there's a social conscience about fasting. Okay? So this is also important that Ramadan does not become a celebration. Eid is the celebration. You're not 30 days of Eid and then one more Eid. 
But this month of Ramadan, <coughs> I really want you to take away that have I made certain plans to push myself, not push myself to the brink of, you know, giving up Salah and giving up my deen, I mean, and, you know, and melting down, burning out, but genuinely pushing myself in something I think all of you can do is reflect. Read the Quran and reflect. Another thing we should avoid that uh, happens is just as there is what I describe, my students know this, we call this performative Islam, where we start acting out what we think should be expected of us without really thinking about what we're doing. We also have collective performances. Ramadan is an ideal time for, unfortunately, collective performance, where we're not necessarily, where we are, we are praying 20 rak'ah, you know, taraweeh, and people are not even praying, doing their fard. And uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, he mentions this. He mentions a beautiful example from the Qur'an. He mentions the fake piety of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. The fake piety of the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. See, the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam actually came to Egypt. And as you know, Yusuf alayhi salam, you know, they don't recognize who he was. He was the Aziz. And they came to visit Right? To look, their father had sent them. And they went there to get what their portion is in their portion of food. And the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they came with their camels. And something in the, the, the organizers, at the, the ones who organize giving you your share, some of them had doubts in the, the brothers. They had their doubts in the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. And so they said, They said, O oh, you people of caravans, uh, Yusuf alayhi salam's brothers, Indeed, you guys are thieves. You guys are thieves. And what did they say? What did the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam say? They said, قَالُوا تَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ عَلِمْتُمْ مَا جِئْنَا لِنُفْسِدَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَا كُنَّا سَارِقِينَ They said, Wallahi basically, by Allah, indeed, you know for sure, you already know, مَا جِئْنَا Yeah, we have not come to cause any corruption in the earth, to do any kind of sin, any kind of fasad. وَمَا كُنَّا سَارِقِينَ And we're no kind of thief, we're not thieves at all. This was an act of fake piety, do you know why? Because the, if you read the tafsir of this, the brothers of Yusuf salam, tied the mouths of their camels so that they could not eat from the grass of Egypt. Because obviously it would be theft. They're eating from land that does not belong to them. So the, they tied the mouths of the camels so they couldn't eat any of the grass. So when they were told you guys are thieves, they're like, thieves, us. Look at our camels. We tie their mouths so they don't even eat of land that doesn't belong to us. This was fake piety. Why? Because they prevented their camels from a bite, a mere bite of the grass. Isn't it? But they threw their brother in the well. And subsequently, subsequently he was sold for less than a lukma, less than a morsel of food. He was sold. Subhanallah. And this should teach us about, reflect on our community, that yes, we want to pray, we want to do many things. Has that actually improved? Are we throwing people down the well this month of Ramadan? People are throwing people down the well and then crying. And then, you know, then throwing someone else down the well, either through their speech, either through their actions, either through their transactions. Sometimes even as a community, that we hear something happens in Palestine and we think, oh, it's, yeah, it's just another thing. That we don't realize that it's the state of our Iman is being tested and how we feel about our brothers and sisters over there. Inishtaka aynuhu, ishtaka kullu, inishtaka ratsu, ishtaka kullu. That if part of the body hurts, all of us hurt in fever. But have we thrown everyone, are we throwing the ummah down the well for the sake of fake piety? This is something to consider. Got five minutes? Can I have five minutes? So, this is what Ibn al-Jawzi says about fake piety, especially in the month of Ramadan. Allah SWT warns this. <coughs> he says, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسِ Do you invite people to? Do you command people to? بِالْبِرِّ To goodness. وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ And you forget yourself. وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ While you're reciting the book, while you're reciting the Quran, 
One of the biggest problems of not knowing what we're reciting is that we're not, we're reciting ayat of obligations that we are not fulfilling. And this is something we need to, again, and this for me, I wrote this down as kind of a few commitments we need to make. So my first commitment I ask you to make, inshallah, going forward past Eid, you know, past Ramadan, inshallah, we make it past there, is that commitment number one is that I will take my time to get my act together. Yeah, before I get dragged into other people's gossip and other people's issues. And I will learn and implement as I go and strive to be authentic. That authenticity through reflection, if you got that this month of Ramadan, you have, would have gained a great, great deal. The second thing is to do with commitment. There's so much to say, not enough time. I'm, this is it's a Ramadan event, it never works out. Yeah, so let me see. Yeah. One of the biggest things, I, I'll, I'll, I'll skip 80% of my, and I just want to say one thing, yeah, is the consumerist. Well, like the, this month of Ramadan for the brothers and the sisters, it's been like sometimes a fashion catwalk. I'm not saying that we should not want to wear nice, beautiful clothes in month of Ramadan. But if people praying two rakat and just leaving and, you know, dressing, uh, the, we spent more time dressing up than we did praying. And we need to think about why this is happening. Why in the month of Ramadan it's become such a consumer experience. And I don't just blame consumers. Organizations are also become many vendors. We are salesmen and we are customers. We are no longer musallis and we are no longer you know, organizations and jama'at. But we are salesmen and we are customers, vendors and customers. We need to really think about how that Ramadan has become like this. Because if I were to write a curriculum, I, I, I'm sitting with many sh uh, shuyukh about building the curriculum for subsequent years coming in, in for the Quran Institute. That when we're building the curriculum, we put so much thought that it takes a year to sit down and think about all of the things we think you need to learn in a curriculum for the Institute. It takes a year to sit down with other scholars and hash things out of what a curriculum should look like. What's our curriculum in this room? My curriculum, your curriculum. Our curriculum is whatever the algorithms throw up on social media, on YouTube, whatever has had paid monetized ads or whatever. A monkey with a typewriter could write a better curriculum than the. I'm not talking about the knowledge. You're going to say, brother, have you got something against this uh, Iman boosting video? I've got nothing against it. Masha Allah. Yeah, we need to move beyond life support machine dawah, but it's very important as well. But I'm asking you something that who built your curriculum? Have you not ever thought about that? You send people to a madrasa, you want to know a curriculum. You send them to an institute, you have a curriculum. We're learning our deen majority of the time from YouTube. Where's the curriculum? The curriculum is literally an algorithm. You know, meta tags. You know, it's visibility based on even what the owners want you to see and what you not, not want you to see. Be very, very careful being a consumer, being steered and seeing yourself as a consumer because if you think that the dunya can't lead you to think that if you think that the dunya cannot lead you to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you think that buying things cannot distract you from Allah and make you completely forget the akhirah we haven't read the Quran you know this is in surah surah Humaza. you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says alladhi jama'a malan wa addada that people amass wealth and they hoard it they hoard wealth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ يَحْسَبُ أَنَّهُ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ Yeah, that, ma, that his mal, maluhu akhlada. Man thinks that what he has acquired will make him live forever. Live forever. Allah is telling that. And Allah will not, Allah is not, Allah will only tell you the truth. And Allah is telling you that this dunya is a means to make you think you will not die and you will live forever. I want you to really, really think about that. That this month has mostly just been a consumer experience. I swear to God, so many things are happening as just customers roving around, thinking what to wear and buy and smell like. And that's it. We need to think about where is our da'wah and our khidmah. Can any of you after the month of Ramadan, I'll do a fundraiser now, yeah, let's go into fundraiser mode. Actually, I don't do fundraisers, but I'll, do, I'll say one thing. I'll fundraise for action. Someone who says I can commit an hour a week. Someone who says I can commit an hour or a month, uh, uh, an hour a month to khidma and service to the community. 
You know, people were laid these carpets. I have no problem. It's not a jibe or anything. But they were laid down by eight and nine-year-olds <laughs> at four in the morning. Think about where the lacking is in our community. I'm going to keep it real. I'm not going to sit here and just, you know, entertain you. I'm saying that we need to be people who fundraise action. Fundraise for action for once a week or once a month. I know brothers I work with here, they told me, Saturday I've given for the sake of Allah. No wife, no family, no, no one can find me. Saturday I give for the deen. I give for dawah, I do teaching, someone work in my madrasa. They work literally Saturday for three years, they just close their eyes. One of the brothers lives two hour drive from here every Saturday for nearly three years. Right? That's what, that, that's what we call, Ya Yu Alladina Amanu, those who, be, who have committed to Allah. We need to make that level of commitment. So that's my second uh, kind of uh, commitment I want to make, that our second commitment to taqwa should be. I will not be a consumerist Muslim who chases money to spend it on stuff. Rather, I will use my privilege to buy as much freedom as I can from, the, from this race so that I can serve the, the believers, I can serve humanity. That's my second. And the third, I've only got time to mention for one minute. I'm going to ask for one minute. You know, if, you know pri some privilege maybe. One minute. That the third thing, there's uh, Ibn al Jawzi. He mentions his, this in his Sayyid al Khatir. He mentioned this in his book. It's about. Two inches or three inches thick, you know. For you, I wanted to like research stuff and find interesting things that would benefit you and make, give you a, a mind for reflection. What is the most significant focal point in the month of Ramadan? Just think about it. What do, you, what do most people look up and look at in the month of Ramadan? What's the month of Ramadan about? It's start, it's end, it's Eid, Taraweeh is going to start. What's everyone looking at? It's a question. Light al Qadr, but what's the. That's looking for a, p a period of time. But even that's dependent on something else. What's everyone looking at? Quran. No, no. What's the moon? MashaAllah. This, this is it's the moon. We can, the moon, we're moon crazy, right? The month of Ramadan, moon wars, moon crazy. We, are fo we focus a lot on the moon. Ibn al Jawzi says, why you look at the moon? And you don't think? He says, the, room, the moon is a sign of your resurrection. Is a sign of your resurrection. He quotes the poem, Wal Maru Mithlu Hilal in Hina Tubisiruhu, or Talatihi in another version. Yabdu Yabdu Daif and Dail and Thumma Yatasik, Yazdadu Hatta Ida Matama Akobahu, Kuru Jadidain, Naksan Thumma Yan Hamik. Such a beautiful poem. He mentions that man is a crescent, or human beings are like crescents at its beginning, and it starts small and slender and gentle then grows and even increases until it becomes half a moon. And then it reaches its fullness, maybe, I'm going to be biased towards myself because I'm 40. 40 is fullness maybe, it reaches fullness, right? It reaches its fullness at 40, yeah? Then it starts to decline almost instantly. It will, it will soon pass. That it declines night after night until obliteration that would come at the same pace in which it arrived Unless, he mentions, he, got, he adds a bit more to the poem. He says, unless there is an eclipse that gives you a sudden destruction of the moon. And that's what happens. Sometimes uh, you get called back for a second appointment at the hospital. Has anyone ever had a second? It's scary stuff, guys. One minute, you know, you're fine. They say, can you just come back again, please? We need to check. And your whole world starts spinning. And you start thinking about your life and what you've left behind and what you should do and what you should have done and who you should have helped and what you should have thought of and what you should have reflected upon. When we look at this moon, think, how many years have we seen this moon? And we didn't think that, subhanAllah, this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it comes in a very frail, thin, small and it gains body and it becomes strong, bright and then it fades away. And that is exactly what will happen to us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect, resurrect us as believers, as Muslims, as muttaqis, as muhsins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of our sins before we leave this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us live a life that is meaningful and full to Islam. A life of Islam, a meaningful life of Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us die on nothing other than al-Iman. قول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفر وأتوب إليك